Okay, might as well start here. We'll talk about some tools a little bit. You see this rack of tools. Three years ago when I restarted turning, I was taking all these videos from uh, AAW. As you know, you get a lot of conflicting advice. David Ellsworth likes this kind of grind and this kind of thing. And some people push cut and pull cut. And I don't know, I got to find some traction somewhere. And I came across a bunch of uh, uh, videos by Stuart Batty. And I was impressed because they were good, clean videos. No background. Everything was out of the way. You could concentrate on what he was doing and a very organized approach. Let's see, is uh, Mark Snyder on? We have a brand new member, Mark Snyder. Yep, I'm here. Because he's only been turning a short while, but he's already been out and taking the week-long course with uh, uh, Stuart Batty, which I've been trying to do for two years, but for various reasons haven't connected. In any case, I did kind of a shootout on tools. Stuart had created a company to make his own lathe tools. They had since gone out of business, unfortunately. But you can still buy them. what's left from Woodworkers Emporium in uh, Las Vegas. So they're, they're easily removable, simple twist on action. You can tighten them with a little bench wrench uh, if you want to. I find I only use that to take them off rather than tightening them. At the same time at the symposium, I met um, uh, Hannes Mickelson from Vermont. A lot of you know him. And he's got his own system. Let's see, I got him here somewhere. So I initially bought one or two handles from Stuart Batty and this, this expandable one from Mickelson and a couple of uh, Mickelson's uh, gouges and his sharpening system. And I started trying them both and I finally decided I liked Stuart Batty's better. So this is Mickelson's gouge. It's made by Thompson, but it's been glued into a Batty bolster so I can screw it right into the the rest of the lathe system. So I got a retired handle here from uh, from Hannes, if anybody wants one. Uh, I've bought quite a few of these little bolsters and, and the, the things to adjust them. So as I try to flesh out and I can't buy the uh, gouges and such from Batty any longer, I can buy them from Carter and Son or from uh, Thompson, glue them into those, and they'll work with the handle system. So I pretty much work with those uh, almost exclusively. I've got a set of the Carter uh, carbide tools. Cute, don't use them much. Occasionally they fit in some place where I don't have another tool. Some big Sorby scrapers that I've used some. But, uh, and then Stuart Batty has a sharpening system. Caught a chance to catch up with me down here. I find I use the CBN wheels that I get from uh, Wood Turner's Wonders. These rests are baddies. They set with uh, these particular gauges so that the gauge can sit on here. It goes right up against the wheel and you set the exact angle you want. Now here's one of those things where somebody thinks you got a good deal for you. If you buy two, you get the third one free. And they all have different angles and things on them. So, okay, being a sucker for a bargain, I bought two and got the third one free. I've never used anything but the first one. It's got every angle I need on it. So if I ever meet Stuart, I'm gonna say, hey, what's up with those other two? But I do find I like those. And uh, let me just grab a tool here. Jim, you got one of those tools? without a handle. There you go, that's fine. So, this is all a freehand system where you set the angle of this. I put some tape on here to show me the, the relief angle and just simply wrap it around. And then you can, by hand, you can back cut it and so on. So I've gotten where I can do that pretty well. And I like that better than the Mickelson system where you've got to come up with this. And the first thing that bothered me about him is he's selling me something that wouldn't fit the gouges I bought. But, but these go into your, uh, the one-way Wolverine system and you can do it. They work slick. 
but you're in and out setting them, <laughs> set them in here, get the right depth, come down, wind and grind. They make a beautiful thing, a little better than my handheld, but uh, again, I settled in on doing it Batty's way. And what else you got? Put that down below. Well, this is just a buffing wheel that needs to be remounted a little bit. This was a, a jig I made that will go on the fence on the table saw. And I can take something that's in a chuck, put it on here and adjust it, and I can run it through the bandsaw. So in some cases, if I'm trying to take a lid off a bowl, I don't want to part it off too deep. I've been experimenting with that, and it works pretty slick. All right. All right. For sanding, I've made this little rig, and it lets me bring this around over by the lathes. When I'm over here sanding, I've got everything I need comes right along. Now, let me just show you the, if I can sneak past here, the right drawer. I really like these twist lock sanding sheets. So here I've got them from 80 to 320. I can bring these out where they're handy. They go into, this is a random orbital sander. I can put either three inch or two inch on it. And uh, simple twist, it's on there. And that works out for me pretty well. I keep a, uh, also a twist lock. This happens to be an electric drill. Uh, it's not random orbital, but I've got the two inch right there. Depending on what I'm doing, if I want to switch to random orbital, I can put the two inch on there. And then I've got these short pigtails to blow things off. So that's all there, but when I'm not sanding or kneading it, I can slip it right back here out of the way. And uh, that makes it work out. What do you have uh, your face shield sitting in? Well, I. I, I Okay, he asked, what, what is this face shield sitting on? And it's sitting on a homemade head. Oh, I finally put it right there. Uh, while we're at it, this is an Air Shield Pro. Talked to Ron Marcou about him some time ago. He was a little smarter than me. He bought a different brand, and it's quite a bit more money. It's always amazed me that something like this sells for over $300. And yet its competitors sell for three and four times that. And some of them involve putting a, a waste pack on to take some of the weight. This is fairly light. It could be a more comfortable head setup. The biggest deficiencies with it are two. One is the impeller that blows the air is very fragile. I had it sitting on a lathe extension that was about two feet, less than two feet off the ground, fell off, hit the floor. That was the end of it. Broke the little impeller in there. It's far lighter weight than it needed to be. It's, it's trivial in comparison to the rest. Fortunately, when I, I saw the trend booth at uh, Raleigh, the guy took pity on me and sent me a, a replacement. But I have to be very careful not to draw it, drop it. And I have seen on YouTube that others have had exactly that same problem. The other problem is with the batteries. They're, a totally unique shape, as every manufacturer seems to have. They're old NICADs. I'm lucky if I can get an hour out of this. It's supposed to last all day. I bought a second battery and a, and a cradle. Uh, they're very expensive for, the, for these things. You're paying 100, 100 bucks for the cradle, and it's not a smart cradle. It doesn't go into a trickle mode, so if you leave it plugged in, which I do with most of my other batteries. I've always got a spare battery in the charger ready to go. In this case, I can't. And when the power gets a little bit low after 45 minutes or an hour, it starts beeping like a bulldozer going backwards, which is very annoying. And uh, so I'm thinking about a replacement or retrofitting it. I'd probably go to something like this Bosch 12 volt, kludge up some way to put it on here. Uh, it doesn't weigh any more than this. It weighs probably less and is reliable and lasts and has a good charger. So I really don't recommend these guys.
It seems like an awful lot of money, but the next alternative is three and four times as much. All right, let's see. That was one thing I wanted to cover. Put the sign on the wall and work our way down. All right, well, as a matter of just trying to keep everything organized and close, we had various things tucked away here that don't get used real often. This is a McNaughton uh, coring system. Probably should do a whole demo on, on coring at some point because a lot of you are probably curious. I picked the McNaughton system because you've got some latitude in how you set the cutters and you can have different shapes as opposed to the one way or the, uh, uh, I forget the name of the third system, which are pretty much fixed. The shape that you, you core to is, is fixed, where this I can vary it a little. Uh, this is the, the heart of the system, fits in the uh, tool rest. And then the, the tools come in three different widths. This is the large, so it fits through the large thing. I, I need to tune this one up a little bit. You need to take a, a file and smooth them before use. This one hasn't been used yet. It's a handle that goes on it, and you just drive that puppy right on in there. I know Ron has uh, put together a really impressive bowl steady. It's a great big round thing. You ought to see it. I'm sure he'll demonstrate it when we're in his shop. And that holds the bowl steady. My solution has been to get a, a five inch uh, Titan III uh, jaw set. And uh, it's, it's, it's quite deep, good and strong. Whenever you're doing these uh, uh, dovetail tenons, you want to be sure that you've got the angle matching up neatly with the inside of this, and that the face of the bowl is undercut slightly, so that where the jaw meets the bowl, it's the outer rim that's in contact. If you do it the opposite and the inner rim is in contact, you're going to lose that tenon. You get much of a catch and it'll break. Whereas if it's out here to the outside, it transfers the force very differently. So since I've been doing that, I haven't had any tenon failures at all. And when I'm coring, it's putting quite a load on the thing. So generally coring, I'm doing bigger pieces and trying to get two or three nested bowls. I'm not good enough as Mike Mahoney to get four or five. He does some amazing stuff. Something to aspire to. All right. Nova chucks. I don't know how many of you have Nova chucks. It's probably the most common uh, chuck in the marketplace. When I went to buy some, I looked up the Novas and compared them to the One Ways, and Woodcraft said they had both. I looked around and said, yeah, I think I'll get the One Way. Well, I get over to Woodcraft, they didn't have any in stock. All they had was the Novas. So I brought one home and uh, over the course of time have standardized on it. And one of the good things about Nova is it has multiple sizes and attachments. I don't think anybody else has anywhere near this number of attachments. And of course, that means you're spending a lot of time changing attachments and messing around. So I've tried to standardize on using the, the 100 millimeter for, for mid-sized bowls and the 50 millimeter for smaller bowls. And then I recently got the larger chuck. It takes all of the same uh, jaws, but it's a much bigger chuck, bigger and heavier. And for big bowls, I use that. Now, by using um, the Novas, I like the flexibility that I can do a whole bunch without ever taking this off of the lathe. Because a lot of times I'm starting with a woodworm screw, which fits right in here in the chuck. I've got a template set up so that if I'm dealing with, well, that's, that's this one here. This one here gives me the minimum and maximum. Yeah. There we go. 
like I said, minimum or maximum uh, tenon size or recess size with, with the one template. And uh, so I start off on a woodworm, cut a tenon on the opposite side, flip it around into the same chuck. If I'm starting out between centers for various reasons, I've got a stub center that fits right in there. So again, I'm not having to ever take that thing off. So as long as I'm staying in that same size regime, uh, I get a lot of advantage. Is that a template again? A template for size uh, tenon? Yeah. Okay, so it's the tenon, the, the minimum size tenon that it can still grip is for the smaller size, and the maximum is this outer size. And that's one drawback to it, is the total travel on the jaws is relatively small. So you've got to be fairly accurate about what you set. I notice that a lot of demonstrators using a one-way or a Vic mark, they've got a much longer range of travel, as does the, uh, the Titan III. And so if you get anywhere in between, you're okay. If you're trying to optimize it, you're trying to set it up where it's uh, about three millimeters apart when you get done clamping it because it's about a three, three millimeter piece that they take out when they cut these four jaws apart at the factory. So if you set it for that exact size, you're gonna get by far the, the tightest hold. I've got a magnet here. I keep the wrench for that, the wrench for the cold jaws. One of my favorite tools, soft jaw pliers. At my age, a lot of smaller screws. I don't have the strength to get them tight enough particularly all the, the blade adjustments on the, on the Powermatic uh, bandsaw, they'll just come undone shortly. So with this, I can quickly tighten something and I don't I get it all scored up with uh, like a regular plier would do. Use this to get the chuck on and off. And those are all right here at hand. Something not to buy, Nova puts this thing out. That's a little special purpose wrench. It's got gnarly sharp edges. You can hurt your hand. And it's flimsy enough that uh, it just doesn't have the oomph to do it. If I'd been smart, I would have paid attention to the ratings on Amazon, which says, don't buy this piece of crap. I ended up spending 19 bucks for a piece of crap. I got what I deserved. All right. That's kind of the Nova stuff. We talked to this. Oh, here's, here's a little tool I'd recommend to all of you. Mm. These are Apple Airbud Pros. I think they're fairly new. I think they just came out in the last few months. And the difference between these and the highly rated Airbuds, these have full noise suppression. So the thing I like about them, I can put them in my ears, I can listen to my tunes, if the phone rings, uh, it dims right down and I'm connected immediately to my phone, which is a good safety feature. And it also helps me with the problem that my wife or daughter love to come ask questions. And usually I'm sitting here with a lot of noise going, I can't hear anything and ah, I get scared the heck out of me. So I had actually bought some of these things on Amazon. They're designed for, what are they doing? They're designed for deaf people. Well, it puts a nice little tone out. I can tell which one is this door and which one is that door. Um, generally, I hear it rather than see the light. It's supposed to blink, you know, so a, a deaf person could be alerted. But now that I've got the, the earbuds, I really don't need it because I can just tell my, my wife, if you need me, call. Because it quietly dims the sound. It's not threatening. And... Uh, uh, I'm, I'm just all set, so I'm very happy with these. Uh, I bought the Case Extra on Amazon for, I don't know, 10 or 15 bucks. It came with a little rubber thing that'll connect the two, and it hangs behind your head if you want it, because they do fall out. And if you lose it in this pile of sawdust down here, you're going to be hunting for a needle in the haystack.